Okay, welcome everybody to uh, this rendition of the Bull Seminar. Um, I would like to go ahead and invite uh, Dr. Phil Chilson to introduce today's speaker. Yeah, greetings everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce Brian Green to you as this <clears throat> as a speaker for today. He's been with the uh, School of Meteorology for few years now and I, I still think back on the time when I met him as a, a visiting student weekend attendee and he struck me then as being somebody who had a firm idea of what they wanted to do but what he wanted to do back then was to do more severe weather and radar stuff but we kind of convinced him that there were other options and luckily he's <laughs> kind of going down that path and now is doing quite different types of topics, but um, he's, he's making great strides in them. And I'm very interested to hear about this topic because this is something he's been working on largely with um, Scott Selesky. So this will be new information for me as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing this as much as I'm sure all of you are. So Brian, um, take it away. Great, thank you guys. Thank you, Phil, for that introduction. <clears throat> Hopefully y'all can see my screen. I've got uh, subtitles on. All right, now hopefully those don't make me look like a doofus while I'm talking. I'll just make myself look like one. So uh, yes, today I'm talking about trying to bring together the world of large eddy simulations and UAS, a really awesome couple of technologies that are really exploding in recent, in recent years. Um, I think we're at a perfect time to really harness those together today. So uh, before we get started, I think it's important that we acknowledge that long before here at the University of Oklahoma was established and before the state of Oklahoma was uh, created, uh, this area was the traditional home of the Caddo Nation and Wichita tribes. We need to acknowledge that this area served as a hunting ground, trade exchange point, and migration route for more than 39 federally recognized tribal nations within the state today. Um, and this is all as a result of settler and colonial practices that were designed to assimilate native people and remove them from uh, existing land in the United States. So the University of Oklahoma recognizes this historical context and this connection with our university and the indigenous community. We need to acknowledge, honor, and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land. And we also fully recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereign rights of all of these tribal nations state federally recognized or not. I know there's more than uh, just the 39 number that you'll see on OUDEI websites. So again, this is not bringing politics into the science. Uh, the identities of the people of this land uh, are inherently married with the science that we all conduct as humans. Uh, and it is an institutional responsibility to recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up our entire OU community. So uh, with that, um, important acknowledgement. I want to also uh, start off on a, on a lighter note. Uh, I've been able to uh, rejoin or re-enter the National Weather Center and work here regularly. I've been, as of last week, um, fully vaccinated. And this comic was sitting on uh, my desk. Um, and I forgot I had printed that out a couple of years ago before the pandemic. Um, and I think it is just as valid as it was before the pandemic as it is now. Uh, hopefully, I have numerous diagrams to show how I was wrong um, or correct in a couple of ways for today. So um, let's go ahead and get started with uh, talking a little bit about the stable boundary layer itself. Um, so again, this is not a talk about tornadoes. I see there's a handful of y'all NSSL people in here. Uh, this is a talk about the small uh, little worlds, little tiny vortices, um, not the big uh, um, streamwise vorticity current or anything you might get in a rapid intensifying tornado. So uh, the stable boundary layer is notoriously very difficult to understand, observe, model, deal with whatsoever. This is largely because the characteristic length scales are very strongly impacted by stratification. Um, make sure I'm not, um, sorry, <laughs> yes, good. Little worlds are great. Um, uh, our characteristic length scales are very strongly impacted by stratification. This really nice conceptual diagram here shows that in the stable boundary layer, um, it, it sees an apparent wall. It's not, eddies are not able to transfer motion or energy very far uh, because of the stable stratification. 
Um, and because our turbulent motions are small in magnitude, are not continuous in time or space, uh, this is a problem known as intermittency. This makes it very difficult to uh, average in time or in space any observations that we collect. And it's not always necessarily capable to compare apples to apples with observations you would get in the convective boundary layer. Um, more so than the convective boundary layer, our stable boundary layers are largely dominated by wave activity, large scale features, any subtle changes in terrain, land use covers, um, all very important. And even though this is all really difficult to work with, uh, there are huge implications for human health, uh, public health, uh, the way that radar beams are able to propagate throughout the atmosphere, um, and not even to mention the amount of error that this propagates throughout our numerical weather prediction. Uh, so one way we kind of get around this in the stable boundary layer is through similarity scaling, a really common one or one of the first ones is known as monin obikov similarity theory. Uh, scaled turbulence as a function of the stability parameter uh, based on this obikov length, which is a function of uh, the surface level momentum flux and surface level heat flux and a buoyancy parameter. Um, this is not the best in the stable boundary layer. It, it does fine in the convective boundary layer for a number of assumptions that need to be met. Um, but the, the biggest problems in the stable boundary layer, at least, are self-correlation, uh, which I'll get into in a little bit, and the fact that these turbulent scales themselves are very poorly defined. There can be large error in the scaling parameters, not to mention the turbulence you're trying to scale as well. Um, so in 2010, it's a big Orbion proposed a scaling uh, for the stable boundary layer based on mean gradients, which are much more well-defined in the stable boundary layer. So uh, potential temperature gradient and uh, wind shear make up the Richardson number, the bulk Richardson number, um, and proposed velocity, temperature, and length scales uh, using uh, these gradient-based similarity scales. So in order to test out this gradient-based similarity scaling, I'm going to be using data from the ISOBAR 2018 field campaign. Uh, if you've seen any of my talks in the past two or three years, you've probably heard me talk ad nauseum about the ISOBAR campaign. But here is uh, BAM's article that we actually recently had published uh, at the beginning of this year. There's a QR code for you to, to snap if you want to grab this figure and learn more all about this uh, awesome campaign took place in Northern Finland in February of 2017 and 2018. Uh, we as OU were able to take part in the campaign in 2018 and it was zoomed in on the right here. You can see that it took place over the sea ice, uh, relatively uh, homogeneous conditions for flows coming from the west or from the south uh, and then the island itself off to the right. We had, uh, this was the first major field campaign in the Arctic to utilize uh, uncrewed aircraft systems or UAS um, to measure the stable boundary layer. And this was a huge success in that endeavor. Um, we also had surface-based towers with eddy covariance systems, surface-based remote sensors like LIDARs and SODARs. Um, and that will make up the bulk of my analysis uh, looking forward. So if we go ahead and plot the, the traditional phi m and phi h dimensionless velocity and potential temperature gradients, um, we can see that as a function of the stability parameter z over lambda, the local stability or Obukov length, um, we see pretty good convergence along the boussinger dyer formulation of the stability functions in uh, phi m, and we see a lot larger spread in phi h. And this is actually exactly consistent with what we would expect uh, for self-correlation self because errors in U star um, are kind of perpendicular to the errors in theta star um, for a given stability range. So that increases the spread in phi, star, in phi H um, really shows that, you know, for anything other than momentum, this is not a great framework to be dealing with anything in. <laughs> and I know a lot of our numerical weather prediction models rely upon these formulations or tweaks to them. Uh, but if we go ahead and apply our gradient-based scales to uh, the same data set, this was 10-minute uh, average fluxes uh, in momentum and heat are shown here. I also have scales for uh, vertical velocity vari variance and uh, potential temperature variance. But for the sake of brevity here, I'll just show these two. Um, we can see that these empirical curves from the Sorbion 2010 paper match very well with, with the observations from ISOBAR. Um, 
especially at the five meter level. So we have three levels of eddy covariance systems. Um, and the reason for the best convergence on the five meter level is most likely because I calculated these gradients based on fitting uh, second order functions as a, as a function of log of height. Um, so at the lowest level, we can have a constraint for velocity going to zero at the friction or the aerodynamics, aerodynamic roughness length Z naught, um, but there's no constraint above 10 meters. Uh, so the five meter in both temperature and wind speed um, are constrained by two levels above and below it. So um, I think that's the biggest takeaway here for the uh, tower data. And what we really were trying to get at in this paper, which I have in preparation for boundary layers, so Evgeny, keep your eyes out for <laughs> a new paper coming, um, is now that we have these gradients that are really easily or really readily measured by a fixed wing air or a rotary wing aircraft flying vertical profiles, is there a way that we can extend this type of similarity theory to get vertical profiles of momentum and heat fluxes? And it turns out that if we are to measure, uh, or if we are to periodically measure um, about three times per hour in the stable boundary layers, what we were doing uh, during isobar, and we average all of these in time to get a single profile that's kind of smoothed out and calculate our gradients from these profiles, we can get uh, uh, something that approaches a physical representation uh, that matches with observations. And to show that, I have a case here um, from ISOBAR. This is a one hour period on one of our IOP nights. Uh, we have a roughly neutral layer uh, close to the ground. This is probably because we had a shallow cloud layer uh, making the radiation balance close to zero and causing uh, a neutrally stratified boundary layer. We had a, a low level jet core of about six meters per second at about 70 meters. That's what that horizontal red line is. Um, and the Richardson number I've plotted on a log axis kind of does reach a peak at that low level jet. It's kind of a, a first estimate at the stable boundary layer depth. Um, and the wind direction shows that winds were largely from the southeast to the south um, in, in the boundary layer depth, uh, which as you recall is across a fetch of mostly sea ice. Um, whether or not clouds impact the further results is, is beyond the scope of what we are discussing here. Uh, so plotted here, I have from left to right, this is uh, momentum flux, heat flux, uh, vertical velocity standard deviation, and potential temperature standard deviations. Um, and the blue shaded lines close to the bottom, if you really zoom in and squint your eyes, uh, those are the values measured by the tower. And then the purple shaded lines are from, we had a LIDAR that was able to give an estimate of uh, vertical uh, sigma W as well. And as far as we can tell, everything is matching uh, to an order of magnitude um, in the same uh, level of uh, measurement accuracy. Uh, you can see the, the direction or the gradient of, uh, of heat flux is decreasing or increasing in magnitude negatively with height. Uh, and that continues with the observations from the cloud, uh, from the copter sound. Uh, same thing with the uh, momentum flux kind of increases with height, reaches a maximum just below uh, the core of the low-level jet, I think is really interesting and I think is also showing up in some of the signals uh, for simulations that, that I'll show in a little bit. Uh, but this is a pretty good, uh, we, we show a couple other case studies in our paper here, uh, but this is a really good first start um, with uh, using this type of framework to really back out the really important uh, flux measurements that we're not necessarily capable of resolving explicitly. Uh, however, the copter sound is capable to a really high accuracy as seen in uh, Tyler's paper um, that was accepted this year or last year. I, time is irrelevant. Whenever that came out, um, uh, we're really good at measuring temperature, wind speed, uh, dew point, and pressure with height. So uh, we feel pretty good about this right now. Uh, so a summary of this first part of observations is that this gradient-based scaling regime does seem appropriate for our tower data. Uh, results show that uh, that, that was all uh, fine and dandy. Uh, we showed that an approach to extending this to UAS, because calculating Richardson number is very noisy without smooth profiles, uh, time averaging these profiles and calculating statistics based on the mean uh, profiles uh, did help out with this. 
am still not married to this choice of scales. Uh, Z from the ground, we already know that uh, turbulence in the stable boundary layer is not necessarily uh, attached to the wall like it is, or it can be shown in the neutral or convective boundary layer. Um, and then gamma and N are kind of double dipping because N contains uh, the derivative of potential temperature with height. So um, I'm working on a couple other formulations of this, uh, but to be more direct, there is another way we can validate our observations in a much broader sense. And that's where I come to the second part of my talk here, which is about modifying large eddy simulations specifically for the stable boundary layer. So quick primer on LES, this is different uh, from, it's a very uh, Goldilocks zone of modeling the atmospheric flows. So if we look at just this, uh, the, basically a histogram of the energy containing um, eddies as a function of size with our energy producing on the left side and our energy dissipating on the right side, that's where most of the turbulence lives within uh, atmospheric flows. So on one extreme, we have direct numerical simulation where you can resolve all the way down the entire flow. All of your statistics are explicitly captured. You don't need to parameterize anything. Um, there is Reynolds average Navier Stokes that averages down to a mesoscale size or whatever. Um, and you have to parameterize basically all of your turbulence within the boundary layer. But large eddy simulation kind of fits somewhere in between. So our grid spacing is somewhere in the middle of this spectrum so that we are able to resolve some eddies but need to model the rest of them. Um, so here in the stable boundary layer, especially our length scales are very small. So we need to choose a really large or a really high uh, resolution of our grid spacing uh, so that our subgrid model isn't doing too much work and becoming non-physical. Uh, and another big change between LES for the convective or neutral boundary layer versus the stable boundary layer is that in order to reproduce realistic flows, we actually care about instead of uh, prescribing a surface um, heat flux, we prescribe a surface temperature cooling rate. Um, and studies have shown that this is a much more uh, appropriate method. I think Jeremy has a paper on this as well. Um, showing that this is the appropriate way to do so. So for this suite of simulations that I'm going to be showing, uh, I chose a value of one Kelvin per hour. That is definitely on the stabler side of things, as you'll see from the, the final profiles that I come up with. Um, but uh, this is kind of just a, a, a limiting case scenario type thing. So we have an 800 meter by 800 meter by 400 meter box uh, that we're simulating uh, with a forced by geostrophic wind and Coriolis parameter at about 65 degrees north. Geostrophic wind of eight meters per second is also a little bit large um, for, for co direct comparison to isobar. Um, but again, that's not uh, terribly skewing our results. Uh, the roughness length is a little bit large for 0.1 meters, but that's also because uh, it's really difficult to resolve your eddies in the lowest layer close to the wall. In LES, in general, it's even more so difficult to do so in the stable boundary layer. So uh, for the sake of uh, model convergence and keeping our CFL limit in check, I had to choose a, a Z naught of about 0.1 meters. And in order to, uh, because I was modifying uh, Scott Selesky's code kind of out of the box, um, we are running a, a suite of varying grid mesh sizes in order to see how appropriate um, or how effective the different grid sizes are at reproducing our uh, stable boundary layer features. And so that's why I have variable. Uh, but in general, I would run the simulation for 11 total hours and average over the last hour for statistics. Um, so we are using a state of the art, uh, scale dependent Lagrangian subgrid model that is much more capable of resolving uh, turbulent motions, at least in convective boundary layer, it's much more efficient for heter heterogeneous terrain uh, as well as compared to things like just a good old fashioned, uh, excuse me, uh, dynamic scale model or just a static Smogorinsky coefficient. This will readily update uh, the Smogorinsky coefficient um, along fluid parcel paths so that this is much more physically representative of the flow itself and not just a prescribed value a priori. Uh, 
Uh, so we range in size from 96 cubed up to 256 cubed resolution. That's about the upper bound for what Scott's uh, Yeti cluster is capable of uh, handling. I might be able to get it up to about 320, but we're really pushing things at that point. Um, and in order to save disk space and core hours, I basically ran the 96 cube grid out for nine physical hours and then interpolated it for all of the other simulations and ran all of them for two more hours. And like I mentioned, the last quantity or the mean quantities that I'm going to show are averaged in time in X and Y and over the last physical hour. Uh, so 90,000 time steps for the 96 cubed and 180,000 time steps for all of the other ones. So why don't we go ahead and dive into, okay, not yet. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I wanted to show uh, what the initial profiles look like as well. Um, we are entirely geostrophic in U, no uh, W or V initially. And we start with a two layer temperature profile, which is really common for uh, LES in the stable boundary layer. And we always start with some perturbations in the lowest, I think 50 meters uh, in order to kick off some of the turbulent mixing at the start of the simulation. Okay, now are the results. Uh, so our first order moments. So again, these brackets are gonna denote averages in X, Y, and time uh, is an approximation of our ensemble mean of everything. Um, and I have grid sensitivity results for U and B, wind speed, and theta bar here. Um, and we can tell that the height of the low level jet is seeming to decrease a little bit uh, for increasing grid size or increasing grid resolution, my bad. Uh, which is subtle, um, but also somewhat makes sense because you get more fine scale understanding of the, the vertical mixing um, being physically resolved. And our temperature profiles also are surprisingly very similar. Um, this box in the red is an estimate of the stable boundary layer depth, which I will be using as a scale on the Z axis. So I will be plotting things as a function of Z over H. I called it ZI. It's kind of interchangeable in the stable boundary layer. Uh, but these are determined based on the flux profiles. Uh, basically, you determine where uh, the stable boundary layer is determined as um, where your uh, vertical momentum flux reaches a level of 5% its surface value, and then you extrapolate that by dividing by 95%. Um, and we can see that there's not too much of a pattern for uh, increasing grid resolution here. Um, but we will see in a minute that uh, there are other factors at play here, but they are all around uh, 160 to 230 meters. So plus or minus 80 meters, 70 meters isn't half bad. Um, in terms of the covariances, so I have streamwise, crosswise, and kinematic heat fluxes here. Um, our surface magnitudes uh, all seem to decrease as uh, our resolution increases. Uh, our 256 cube simulation is definitely doing something funky. The concavity and the wiggliness of the profiles is definitely an outlier from the rest of them. Um, but at least as we approach the top of the boundary layer, um, things seem to even out at least. Um, our magnitudes of heat flux, again, vary by any, about 20 to 30% uh, at the surface. Um, so keep that in the back of your uh, mind as we move forward here as well. Uh, looking at the individual variances, oh, let me also mention that these fluxes are the total sum, the resolved plus the subgrid components of all of these uh, parameters. So um, these are the total ones. However, the variances, which I'm going to show here, are just the resolved because our um, the way our model works is that the sum of the diagonal components of the, the subgrid stress tensor adds to zero, so the subgrid terms and the variances at least are very small. Um, so these are just resolved and also rotated such that our uh, mean V wind it goes to zero. Um, again, our 256 cube simulation is off on its own. Um, I don't entirely have an explanation for why that is the case yet. But in general, for increasing uh, resolution, our variance in V prime at least uh, it seems to increase in magnitude and decrease in height, which I think is very interesting. I think, again, related to better resolution of our vertical mixing around the, the stable boundary layer uh, height and the height of the low of the jet. Uh, and our W prime is pretty smooth, uh, decreasing with height um, in general, aside from the surface as well. 
Uh, just for fun, I have TKE, temperature variance, and uh, U-star as a function of height. Um, honestly, I can't tell you what the 256 cube simulation is doing at this point. I think it might be celebrating 420 a bit early. Um, but because, I mean, what is this? It's half as much as all the other ones. And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an explanation for that yet. Um, but at least for the other simulation uh, resolutions, our temperature variance seems pretty, pretty consistent with height um, across the relative um, uh, distributions. So a quick summary of this grid sensitivity testing. This is all pretty preliminary. Um, we have reasonable convergence for first order mean quantities. This is the first time I'm showing any of this. Um, this is kind of the first time presenting these results from this modified code. Um, pretty not great otherwise, though, but I'm we're thinking that this is likely related to the amount of time that I'm averaging over. Um, so I, I mentioned that I'm averaging over a constant one hour. Um, that's somewhat arbitrary. And I know in convective boundary layer studies, uh, we like to typically define a, a dimensionless eddy turnover time um, or a dimensionless time period. Um, and that's easy to do when you have things like W star and ZI as your definitions in the state in the convective boundary layer. But here, uh, that's not as easy to do. U star and Z and things like that aren't necessarily um, representative parameters to scale with. So definitely looking into averaging over varying periods um, in the stable boundary layer. And the 256 cubed simulation did show a bit better convergence for a bit longer averaging. Um, but for the sake of this talk, I'm just showing uh, uh, apples to apples here. Um, it might be related to explicitly resolving more internal shear layers. As I'll show in a minute, um, this might actually prove to be the case. So I do have a couple more tricks up my sleeve um, for today's talk. Uh, after running all of these simulations, Scott and I realized eh, it would probably be useful to include uh, the dissipation rate of turbulence in these LES simulations. So uh, the actual direct viscous dissipation is typically small at LES filter scale, but what we can define is a transfer, a rate of transfer of energy from filter to subfilter scales. Um, and I think this model does allow backscattering, which means subfilter to filter scales. But um, this is PR as defined by Pope, which is a combination of subgrid tensor and the um, filtered strain rate tensors, which is readily available in, in the guts of the code. Um, and this is effectively our dissipation rate when working in LES land. So by adding these as an output, uh, we're able to calculate fun things like the Osmanov length scale and our individual TKE budget terms to really see um, what is happening in our code. So I ran one more 96 cube simulation to test this because those run really quick. Um, on our cluster, uh, and that's what I'm about to show y'all. So the Osmanov length scale LO uh, physically represents the smallest size of eddies that are preferentially affected by buoyancy instead of shear. And what this really means is that this is the smallest scale that your LES technically should be resolving if you actually want to be resolving some real physics in your simulations. Um, traditional SGS models like Static Smogrinsky are not really defined, designed to operate uh, for, a, for your grid size larger than any of these scales. Um, and this is uh, really good results from Sullivan et al. 2016 goes in depth about um, uh, these types of analyses. But uh, from their studies, they showed that um, LO depends on stratification primarily. As we can see, uh, dissipation over n squared to the three halves is uh, basically our uh, uh, Brunfeisel of frequency or uh, static stability parameter. Um, but it does, however, not depend much on our grid spacing, the L LO parameter itself. So for the 96 cube simulation, um, we can see the filter width, the vertical red dashed line is larger than LO for the entire depth of the stable boundary layer. This totally makes sense. Uh, we're, we're simulating an extremely stable boundary layer with a relatively coarse uh, uh, mesh. So um, it's OK that this is what's happening. So we're not actually physically resolving these smallest important length scales um, in the SBL. But if you were to think, um, because it depends on stratification for decreasing stability, 
that black line will stretch out farther to the right. Um, remember, we're in a limiting case of extreme stability somewhat. Um, and for decreasing grid size, that vertical red line is going to extend farther over to the left. Um, we're going to be able to resolve our stable boundary layer for some of the larger uh, resolution simulations. So this is really re-encouraging uh, of a result to see so that we are actually able to, to move forward with some of our studies here. Um, finally, for this analysis, we have the TKE budget terms broken down, shear production, buoyancy production, turbulent transport, and dissipation. Um, here are the equations if you all really want to see these and flex your tensor math knowledge. Um, but the main takeaway, oh, and everything is also scaled by the U star cubed over kappa Z. I know I've talked about Z not being the best scaling parameter, but it works here. Um, so we have a main dominance by shear production and dissipation within the stable boundary layer, as we would expect. Uh, our buoyancy production is also the next largest term throughout, or technically buoyancy destruction. Um, and our turbulent transport, thankfully, is very small throughout the boundary layer, as we would also somewhat expect. Um, so this is, this is also encouraging to see that our terms are balancing, as we would hope, because that is how the model was designed. But um, with all the troubles we were having with converging on grid sizes, this all is within reasonable ranges, um, especially uh, within the context of literature. I also noticed that there is this really interesting crossover between the magnitudes of the scaled buoyancy production and 3D dissipation directly at the exact level of the low level jet height. I don't know if that means anything or if that's really a coincidence. So maybe someone in the audience can can explain that more to me. I don't think I've pointed this out to Scott either. So this is pretty cool. Um, so, OK, we have an LES model that is at least somewhat physical um, in measuring and simulating the stable boundary layer. What can this do for us looking forward with using UAS as a new sampling strategy? Because we know these are around to stay. We've got the Copter Sun patent pending. Um, shout out to our engineers. Uh, that is a really excellent piece of technology, but we want to make sure we're using it in the best way that we can. So let's take a step back and realize that when we look at the atmosphere from the perspective of a UAS, um, in an XY plane, this is just velocity from one of my simulations uh, at about 20 meters height. Um, if we take a cross section in a constant Y and project this into an X and Z cross section, it's still very uh, highly nonlinear, very highly localized in temperature and wind speed. And this shows us what it looks like when we fly a vertical profile um, through the stable boundary layer. It's really just a one-dimensional snapshot. Snapchat. <laughs> it's a one-dimensional snapshot of the boundary layer um, at any given time. Um, and we really want to know how much can one of these one-dimensional snapshots tell us about the surrounding environment. Uh, so the way that I'm going to approach this question is through the lens of random errors. And this is where it gets kind of mathy and icky. Uh, again, I know it already kind of has been. But uh, random errors are errors due to time averaging over an insufficient period for the time mean to converge to the ensemble mean by the ergodic hypothesis. And this has been studied in signal processing and atmospheric turbulence for a while. But random errors and observations are different than things like bias, just like needing to be calibrated, are different from uh, uh, most things you really think about in terms of errors when you're measuring something. It's because um, in order to average in time long enough from a single point measurement, like a sonic atomometer, you need to be approaching extremely long, long averaging times to approach the ensemble mean, which is really what we care about for these turbulent statistics. Um, so how does this apply to UAS? Well, again, remember that if we're flying a vertical profile um, in space, that really corresponds to a time series of sensor data. Uh, and when you take this time series of sensor data, even though we're averaging into vertical bins, that's still temporal average bins. So we're still applying a time average across these uh, sensor observations from a drone profile. 
and how well do these shortly average, shortly, uh, quickly averaged uh, quantities at each bin level, how well can they represent the surrounding environment? And that is exactly the question that random errors is addressing. Um, so right now, when we fly our UAS, um, so how fast we fly, how high we fly, how fast we sample, um, that really is dictated by our hardware optimization and FAA regulations or whatever country we're in flying regulations. Um, we are capable of flying at, you know, fixed or dynamic uh, response times and ascent rates, but we just don't for the sake of we don't know how to do, we, we don't have any information on why that would be better right now than just a quick profile. Averaging into uh, altitude bins during post-processing is also a back of the envelope kind of consideration for how fast does the sensor respond and how fast are we flying? So I'm here to say that I think there's a way we can learn how to do better. Um, so back to the random error math, um, for a given atmospheric parameter F, this can be velocity or temperature, this can be higher order moments like fluxes or uh, turbulent transport, which ugh, um, you can define your relative random error epsilon uh, using this equation. So this fancy script TF is the integral time scale. Um, you get that from integrating the autocorrelation function um, as a function of lag, which is fun signal processing stuff, and that doesn't always exist. Um, F prime squared brackets is our variance of variable F. F squared brackets is just the mean of the variable F. And T is how long you're averaging these, um, your time, your average time scale. So for example, if I'm looking at a sonic atomometer worth of time series of data and I'm averaging in 30 minute chunks, you're technically putting in values of T bar instead of T uh, brackets. Um, and again, T bracket is what we care about, the ensemble mean. Uh, thankfully, using LES, we can get a decent sense of what the ensemble mean quantities look like because we're going to average for a long time in space um, in X and Y. So we can use that as our background reference state. Uh, so by looking at, by running the math, doing all the autocorrelation stuff, which is actually pretty quick thanks to Fourier transform uh, code, um, I have integral time scales for U, W, and theta. Um, this is all kind of hot off the press here. Um, so I got time scales by doing spatial uh, autocorrelations and then using the Taylor hypothesis to convert to time scales. That's fine. Um, and anytime it drops down to zero, um, especially in the 256 cube profile, that's because the autocorrelation function wouldn't converge, uh, likely due to some wave activity. I need to do some high pass filtering probably. But anyways, the main takeaway here is that we're relatively uh, independent of filter width for all three of these time scales, surprisingly. We're, you know, matter of fractions of a second. Um, we see a nice little decrease with height around the level of the low level jet um, in U. Uh, the W integral time scale, which isn't that useful in the first place, seems to increase with height above that level. Um, and we, we have a nice concave profile for our theta integral time scale as well. So now we have our time scales. We have our LES uh, ensemble approximation of our variances and means. And if we choose a time scale, we can then grab our relative error profiles. And if you look at this right off the bat, oh my God, we're looking at 40 to 60% errors in the lowest couple of levels. Um, so I chose a T of three seconds. So that is very small, um, but that is because um, at least during isobar, we are ascending at about one meter per second. And we know our response time of our sensors is about three seconds. So I was averaging the three meter bins for our post-process data. Um, that corresponds to three seconds. So what this really shows, or my interpretation of this, and I'm uh, anyone here can correct me if I'm wrong about this type of interpretation, but for a given profile during isobar, for example, only averaging for three seconds in U will give anywhere above 50% to 60%, or sorry, 30 to 60% error as compared to the ensemble mean of that domain that we were sampling in. 
This is pretty consistent with uh, observations and previous studies and random or relative random errors um, for longer time scales. If I were to plug in like uh, 30 minutes, our, our percentages are you know in the 10 to 20 percent range, which is uh, uh, in line with literature. So this is not fake math that I'm throwing out here. Um, and thankfully, in temperature, our errors are much smaller too because we're normalizing with you know hundreds of Kelvin squared. So this is a really important lead. Uh, this is again kind of hot off the press. I have uh, I need to do this for other variables like our flux values. That gets a little bit trickier because you're taking the fourth order variance of a flux, basically, which is gross. Um, uh, and you know, doing this for varying levels of stability. But at least for a sum up for this talk, I'm at about 40 minutes, which is right where I was trying to be. Um, we have shown that gradient-based similarity scaling is showing promising leads applying to UAS. Um, I'm working on new scales that will incorporate things like wind shear and getting rid of like Z from the wall. Um, I was able to modify LES or Scott's LES code to do SBL stuff, <laughs> which feels like a pretty big accomplishment. I've been working on this for probably a year or two now in the background. Um, and now this is taking the forefront as this is becoming a bigger part of the rest of my dissertation here. Um, we're able to get away with a little bit smaller because of our awesome uh, subgrid model is pretty well documented. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can talk to me or Scott. Probably Scott can be there. <laughs> um, but I mean, people at NCAR are using 1024 cube simulations. They're using like all of Yellowstone for like a month simulation time, uh, like physic, like clock hours, and that's just way beyond the scope of our abilities here. So I think we're pretty happy with the performance of our models. Um, and again, this random error analysis shows that we do have some work to do um, with designing our experiments, flying UAS. This is true for fixed wing, rotary wing, that has none of those implications involved except for that sampling time. So maybe something like um, having a, a drone follow directly behind it, underneath it, so that you can sample right after it, or just ascending more slowly, or adaptively sampling, um, flying slower, low down, and then faster, higher up, because we know our uh, variances decrease with height. Again, very preliminary. I'm going to repeat this with varying stabilities, might even touch into convective, because I know that has the same types of considerations for everyone else here. But uh, with that, I will go ahead and leave my summary inclusions slide up. And I would be happy to take any questions that y'all might have today. Thanks, Brian. Um, so we'll go ahead and open it up to the folks in the audience for questions. Um, so if you do have a question, I'll just ask you to use the raise hand feature in the lower right side of your screen. Um, and once you've raised your hand, I'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. Evgeny? Yes. Brian, did you try to use Zbigniew scaling for your large eddy simulation results? I have. Um, it's not as nice. I haven't really worked too much on it. I kind of did it as like a back of the envelope. Is this even remotely real? And it, it does a decent job. I think the biggest problem was with that Z scaling parameter, to be honest. Mm -hmm. A related question. Did you yes. try to get even more advantage by decreasing the resolution close to the surface in Z to take non-uniform vertical, vertical spacing? I don't know if Scott's code is capable of that. Um, Scott, you might be able to comment on that better than I it's could. Not in the current version. No, we just have a uniform grid in the vertical. Yeah, that would be awesome. Maybe if we could dip into Wharf LES or something, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Any other takers? I know we're not talking about tornadoes. <laughs> All right. I know the full format is always a little
uh, hard to get those questions in. So I do see that Brian has his email up on the screen. So feel free to follow up with him directly. I think I've heard from all the seminar speakers from the last two semesters that as soon as they uh, hop off the call, they've got like three or four emails in the inbox after no one asked questions. So um, we can go ahead and wrap up for now. Um, Thanks everybody for coming out. I do want to let everyone know that we do have a new website for the seminar series, if you're not aware of that. Um, and it's very easy to remember. It's just bliss.science. And you'll find lots of information there. And there's a tab for seminars where you can find all the information. So check it out. Thanks everybody.